Sie, Herr Rachmann. Well, thank you all for coming here. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm proposed to speak for 15 to 20 minutes. I'm lying. It's going to be about 20 minutes. But I'm trying to manage expectations. Um, and uh, the, the piece is called Europe's Problem with Otherness. In a recent interview, the American critic and public intellectual, Leon Wieseltier, argued that America ought to take in more Syrian refugees. When his interviewer countered that the US might share the same anxieties as Europe, Wieseltier's response was that Europe's problem was that its tradition of national identity had no natural understanding of a multi-ethnic society. According to traditional European nationalism, Wieseltier said, the political boundaries and the cultural boundaries should ideally coincide. In a nation state, the state should personify a nation, and a nation should be incarnated in a state, so that you have a series of happy, homogeneous societies living side by side. Europe has a cultural problem with otherness, he said. In New York in the 90s, when, I, when New Yorkers asked me where I was from, all I'd say is that I grew up in Britain. Mentioning that I was born in Bangladesh only drew more questions. New Yorkers, quite evidently, just wanted confirmation of what was to them the, distinct, the distinctive cultural marker, my British accent. That accent was learned from imitating BBC newsreaders on a cassette recorder. At a young age, in the days when children on council estates, projects, and in subsidized housing could rely on decent public libraries, I learned about the Holocaust, the destruction of millions of Jews at the hands of Europeans. The, the fear that gripped a child was that if they, the whites, could do that to people who looked like them, imagine what they could do to us, to me. There was nothing I could do about my skin color, but there were certain things I could mold to make my less, myself less alien to these Europeans who seemed so ill at ease with difference. I grew up in a Britain that only the other day spat at non-whites, beat us, and daubed swastikas in public places. Britain constantly exhorts its immigrants to integrate better, constantly frightens its natives with the specter of the fifth column, and in a million subtle ways tells anyone with a touch of dark skin that they should do more to become British and adopt British values. Do it and you'll earn your stripes. But the promise is hollow, for Britain and the rest of Europe fail to keep their side of the bargain. They never had any intention to do so. Last January, the Daily Mail ran the kind of front page that makes it the laughing stock of thoughtful people, or at least of those with a taste for irony. On the right was a picture of Johanna Conta, Australian-born tennis player who moved to Britain at the age of 14, 14, and was the subject of some controversy concerning the legitimacy of her playing under the British flag. Hands off our tennis golden girls, Aussies, proclaimed the male. Meanwhile, the main headline on that same front page, referring to the British Prime Minister, declared in vast, bold caps, why we must not take 3,000 migrant children. But progressive Britain, readers of The Guardian and listeners of Radio 4, rely on the likes of the Daily Mail and the Telegraph as an alibi taking comfort in the thought that bigotry and blindness are confined to the pages of such papers. Yet if you want to grasp the deeper underlying assumptions that dominate white British thinking or European thinking, it is the writings of the progressive elites, the presumed standard bearers of openness and enlightenment, and the self-proclaimed allies of the oppressed that you must go to, writings rich in parapraxies, and 
slips of the tongue. A few weeks ago, I was invited to join the judging panel for the Pen Pinter Prize, English Pen's award for an, for an author of a significant body of plays, poetry, or fiction of outstanding literary merit. A writer who, according to English Pen's terms, quote, casts an unflinching, unswerving gaze upon the world and shows a fierce intellectual determination to define the real truth of our lives and our societies. Previous winners include Carol Ann Duffy, Salman Rushdie, and Tom Stoppard. Unusually, the winner shares the prize, quote, with an international writer of courage selected by English Pen's Writers at Risk Committee in association with the winner. In my view, this makes it a rather special prize. When my agents learned that English Pen intended to issue a press release about the composition of the judging panel, they sent them the text of my preferred bio. Zia Haider Rahman is the author of In the Light of What We Know, a novel for which he was awarded the James Tate Black Memorial Prize, Britain's oldest literary prize. Penn replied that they wanted, entirely understandably, to issue something that would give a sense of why they'd asked me to judge an important prize with a human rights dimension. We agreed to their su suggested text, and the press release included the words, Born in rural Bangladesh, Zia Haider Rahman was educated at Balliol College, Oxford, and at Cambridge, Munich, and Yale Universities. He has worked as an investment banker on Wall Street and as an international human rights lawyer. In the light of what we know, his first novel won the James Tate Black Memorial Prize, Britain's oldest literary prize. A few days later, the Man Booker Prizes administration issued, issued a message congratulating Peter Stoddard, a former Man Booker judge, for his appointment to the Penn Pinter Committee. It's a long message in which they mention the other two appointments. Vicky Featherstone, artistic director of the Royal Court Theatre, and Zia Haider Rahman, a Bangladeshi banker turned novelist. <laughs> I have no idea what citizenships Peter Stoddard and Vicky Featherstone hold. Rather unhelpfully, Man Booker evidently did not feel compelled to supply that information. It does, however, come as a surprise to learn that I'm Bangladeshi. I don't hold a Bangladeshi passport. I do, however, hold a British one. In fact, until one of them expired last year, I held two valid British passports to enable me to travel to so-called incompatible countries, two countries that each won't permit entry if your passport shows a stamp from the other. Clearly, holding two British passports doesn't make me doubly British. But surely we can agree that in order for something like the Man Booker Prize administration, a bastion of the British establishment, to call me Bangladeshi, they ought to have sufficient reason to believe I am precisely that. Shall we just put the error down to carelessness, a slip born of ignorance of the fact that millions of British citizens are descendants of people born in the post colonies. A slip born of ignorance at, of the fact that millions of British citizens are descendants of people born in the post colonies. Of course, keeping me Bangladeshi does have the advantage of enabling some people to tell me to go back to my own country. Had the man Booker's message been drafted by an educated New Yorker for an American audience, it might have described me as Bangladeshi American. Arguably, much more likely, ethnicity and nationality would have been deemed irrelevant to the context. Drawing attention to such things would have been embarrassing though they might instead have mentioned my human rights background for its obvious relevance and not banking. Educated Americans, educated Americans, pause to consider. The issue is not what I choose to call myself, but what the supposedly educated Britain, and for these purposes I must include the Man Booker Prize administration, the issue is what the supposedly educated Britain chooses to call non-white British citizens. I hope perhaps that Yuri and I will explore that. The issue is not what I call myself. It's what you choose to call me or my counterparts here.
in the Netherlands. In 1999, William McPherson delivered a report following the public inquiry into the murder of Stephen Lawrence, a young black man, and the subsequent failures of the British police. McPherson, a former High Court judge, overcame his ped establishment pedigree and delivered a stunning report that ought to have roused Britain to begin a process of ongoing introspection. Too many natives still take any criticism of racial bias as a charge of bare outright racism. In your defensive pose, you cannot listen. McPherson brought institutional racism, that phrase, into mainstream vocabulary. But what Britain and other European states, particularly the post-colonial ones, have failed to undertake, including their liberal elites that believe themselves exempt, is a sustained inquiry into their own assumptions. Only hard work, only when it is uncomfortable, only then will such an inquiry begin to yield its rewards. McPherson's report highlighted how an institution in its processes can deliver outcomes that are racist. The intractable matter, however, the one that pervades every issue to do with Johnny Foreigner, including immigration or asylum seekers or membership of the EU or wearing the hijab, is that Britain has a cultural problem with otherness. Perhaps it was too much to hope of a legal document. After all, the problem is cultural, and culture moves slowly or in unpredictable ways. The image of a dead boy lying on a beach, his head turned away, thereby allowing us all to project onto him our own beloved son, nephew, or godson, arguably did more to move the debate on refugees than all the earnest roundtable discussions in Brussels. Cultural change is so slow that aside from the occasional shock, all that is available to us is to engage in introspection as a society on a level that is necessarily deeply uncomfortable. Unless I am wrong, this is a project that will find no political champion. What must come under scrutiny, scrutiny are the assumptions embedded in the psyche, assumptions born of hundreds of years of looting and oppression, of colonial presumption and racism. That picture of Tony Blair standing shoulder to shoulder with George Bush, the, last, the leader of the last remaining superpower in the world, both males readying for war, that picture of sublime hubris only makes sense against a history of violence. You're talking about the empire, you say. All that was so long ago. Time to move on. But do we ever hear the same set of the Second World War that came to an end long before the sun set on the British Empire? Your finest hour is well remembered, but the colony's darkest days are best forgotten. Instead, the BBC turns out documentaries about India with the same tired content and format. Last year was a bumper season. The Guardian published a hilarious and serious piece by the novelist Omit Chowdhury ridiculing these shows in which white talking heads opine on Britain's legacy of democracy and clueless white hosts take you on those railways, those bloody railways. Meanwhile, the Indian account is rather different and scarcely gets a look in. No doubt the British media machinery will continue to ill-serve the British people, not to mention history, and churn out the same nonsense in the next cycle. At the Oxford Union last year, in one of the finest defenses of historical accuracy, including some solid facts about those fucking railways. The super articulate Indian MP and former UN Under Secretary General Shashi Tharoor successfully argued that reparations be paid to India. The video went epidemically viral. Intelligently, he said that for him, even one pound every year for the next 200 years would be enough, thereby moving the focus away from quantifying harm and onto admitting guilt and embracing history. A phalanx of gout-addled white establishment fogies op opposing him looked on bemused. Meanwhile, according to a recent YouGov poll, 59%, 59% of Britons think that the British Empire is more something to be proud of rather than ashamed of.
In February, Prince William, who is British, gave a speech at the Foreign Office. Quote, For centuries, Britain has been an outward-looking nation. Hemmed in by sea, we have always sought to explore what is beyond the horizon. Wherever we go, we have a long and proud tradition of seeking out allies and partners. Not to mention colonies and plunder, of course. Referring to his, wife, uh, to his and his wife's forthcoming trip to India, he added that their visit will reflect the best of the modern, forward-looking relationship between India and Britain. Well, let's set aside the optics of this, the inherent comedy of a British heir to the throne in the 21st century, speaking of forward-looking relationships. But what that speech exemplifies by its conspicuous omission is the fundamental denial of a nation of its colonial history. The denial, that is, of a country otherwise obsessed with its history, if daytime television or the popularity of historical fiction or period dramas is anything to go by. The psychic rupture involved in denying its colonialist guilt and all the horrors and the energy required to maintain that rupture exacts a penalty. In November last year, I received an invitation to Christmas drinks at the London Library. The invitation card relayed by my agents gave no clue as to how I came to their attention. The London Library, by way of background, is a 175-year-old institution. Its patron is the Queen, who is British. Membership costs about 500 pounds a year. It is not a public library. When I looked it up on the internet and discovered that its pre president was Tom Stoppard, who is also British, I recall that in an interview for Vanity Fair, the playwright mentioned that he was reading my novel. That's why I was invited, I suppose. But it was something else on the London Library's website that caught my attention. I wrote to Howard Davis, former I wrote to Howard Davis, former British director of the London School of Economics, former head of the UK's financial regulator, and chair of the trustees of the London Library, copying each of the trustees and the president. The first substantive paragraph of that letter reads as follows. London is routinely trumpeted by politicians and commentators as the most diverse city in the world, a melting pot. According to the Greater London Authority, ethnic minorities constitute 44% of the city's population. On the London Library's website, the faces of 16 trustees and 13 staff are proudly displayed, every one of which is white. I pointed out to Davis, the former financial regulator, whose grasp of elementary probability could surely be assumed, that even with an absurdly low assumption of 1 in 40 or 2.5%, of filling any given slot, trustee or employee, even with a 2.5% probability of filling a slot with a non-white in a city with 44% from ethnic minorities, it was still less likely than not that all 29 would be filled by whites. And yet this was not the case. His reply was familiar enough. The governance and staffing did not reflect the diversity that he and his colleagues aspire to, and they recognize that there's work to be done. When I shared, <coughs> when I shared Davis's response, excuse me, when I shared Davis's response with a very close friend, very close friend, white British, someone who acknowledges her decidedly conservative disposition. Her reaction typifies the white British attitude to change on matters of race. She thought his reply was an excellent outcome, a good ending, and she was pleased to see that Davis acknowledged the problem and he was doing something about it. I pointed out that far from describing what they were doing, the letter did not even say that they were doing anything at all. It merely acknowledged a duty, quote, we have to find ways. The fact is that no great change ever came about by simply writing a letter to the powers that be and thanking someone for his attention. And it is too often his attention. For three months, the reply I drafted has been sitting in my computer in a heavy folder called Hope. There's the mental and emotional energy of taking up a fight to think about. We have to pick our battles. 
Davis wrote in his letter that he looked forward to meeting me at the drinks. My reply, still unsent, begins with the regret that we did not meet. Quote, especially since it would have been very easy to spot me in the assembly. <laughs> But the problem with otherness is not just a British one. A nasty undercurrent in the Brexit campaign ahead of a referendum to determine Britain's exit from the EU is hostility toward other Europeans. You like it or not, the British do share something with the mainland. I recently appeared on Bautenhof, Bautenhof a Dutch politics show, arguing that Europe's colonial history has left a stain in its psyche, an animus towards foreigners. Afterward, Aside from the usual racist hate mail, there were messages from non-white Dutch people, most taking issue with one thing. Apparently, I needn't have qualified my remarks by suggesting things were worse in Britain. I shouldn't have let the Netherlands off the hook. Things were just as bad here. I have been cosseted here in Amsterdam, where I'm writer-in-residence at the university, and my novel is a national bestseller. Last week, I attended the annual Buchenbau, a gala celebrating Dutch publishing, the main purpose of which, as was explained to me, is to generate gossip about who had been deemed worthy of tickets. In other words, its function is to establish an inside group. My publisher invited me to a pre-ball dinner at a restaurant. Midway, I remembered my coat. On arrival, I'd left it on a seat somewhere and forgot about it. When eventually a staff member and I found it, valuables still present, I thanked him. It is a pleasure to have you here, he replied. Slightly odd formulation, I thought, putting it down to translation. No, sir, he added, lowering his voice. I mean, it is an honor to have you here. I looked at the man again. I saw you on Bautenhof last week, and everything you said was right but the Dutch won't understand it because they just can't see it. What's your name, I asked. Emile, he said, shaking my hand. It's the name I use at work. My parents are Egyptian, but I was born in the Netherlands. I'm the sommelier here, and I know everything there is to know about wine. I speak Dutch fluently, he told me, in English. I know more about Dutch culture than most Dutch people. I am Dutch but I am never really accepted as Dutch. The encounter moved me. It moves me now, even, as I relate it to you. And then I stepped out into the cold Amsterdam night to recover my composure. Life for immigrant Europeans is a daily confrontation with microaggressions and gestures of alienation. Not long ago, I ran into a well-known British actor and author who lives next door to the house I stay in when I'm in London. Without even greeting me, he exclaimed in thunderous Shakespearean tones as if, as if remembering something he believed I would obviously want to hear. I was just in India, as a matter of fact. He might have rounded it off with old boy. Should I have pointed out to him that India was not my provenance, that South Asia contains nearly a quarter of the world's population, and that there, are, that there are over three million people of varied South Asian descent in Britain and 300,000 of Bangladeshi descent in London alone. America never held as a colony the lands that comprised China, Korea, and Japan, but Britain owned India for 200 years. Yet an educated New Yorker understands not to make assumptions about origins on meeting an East Asian. Why is it that an educated white Londoner cannot do the same with South Asians? The answer must owe something to the history of empire, a European history. The South Asia ingrained in the white British psyche is a subjugated greater India. These days, when a New York asks me where I'm from, sometimes I still might say, just for the hell of it, I was born in Bangladesh. Unfailingly, it's not enough. Sometimes, bless him, he or she says, yeah, but you're British, right? It seems I have to cross the Atlantic to hear this. I can cope. I, I, I can cope. Sheer luck conferred on me a great deal of resilience. 
But when I think of the children in the projects where I grew up and in the underprivileged school in London's East End, where I sat on the Board of Governors, when I think of them and their parents and their hopes and dreams, I know that taking refuge in the novelist's seclusion would be an abrogation. Every battle of ideas is fought on the terrain of language. George Orwell, who is British, reminded us of that. In the northeastern United States and certain other parts of the country, the hyphenated identity does not make you any less American. By the way, no comparison of a European state with the U.S. as a whole makes any sense. Not if you remind yourself how big America is and how many time zones it covers, right? It is a federation, much like the EU project, with the avowed mission, quote, to, to form a more perfect union. So it's entirely reasonable to restrict a comparison between a European state, to restrict it to a particular part of America, and foolish to regard America as a whole. To the native, all of New York turns out for the St. Patrick's Day Parade to celebrate America's Irish-American heritage. Educated Americans feel no unease in identifying someone else, let alone themselves, as Italian-American or Indian-American, or even as both, if that's the case. It is merely a marker of heritage. To the native Brit, the hyphenated identity, Bangladeshi British, Pakistani British, only highlighted otherness, each side regarding it as a concession to the other, rather than both rejoicing in a new stripe in, an, in a rainbow nation. It does not come easily face to face for white Britons to speak of a non-white Britain's nationality. The shuffling feet, the throat clearing, the unmet eye give it away. Hyphenation sounded clunky, felt awkward. Even calling someone just British was less pointed, less charged. The British have history. The British Bangladeshi have punctuation. The conversation about banal identity, as opposed to the richer concepts that scholars deal with, was always going nowhere because it was never a conversation to begin with. It was the confrontation of two monologues with wildly different premises. The natives brought to the table their fears, their hysterical terror. The outsiders, newcomers, Johnny Foreigner, Pakis, Wogs, call her what you like, Bangladeshi, for example. The immigrants came to the table with their dashed hopes and dreams. This was a case study in talking at cross purposes. It is Britain's inherent cultural problem with otherness that makes it difficult for the native to call me British. Difficult even for those who one might naively have thought should know better. If you're not going to call me British when I grew up in Britain, when I hold a British passport and don't, don't hold a Bangladeshi one, when I don't even speak Bengali, when good citizen or mensch that I try to be, I help the elderly neighbor put his flat back bed together and dig out the old ceanothus that another neighbor cannot uproot. When I was educated in Britain, worked in Britain, Quote, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home, unquote. When I washed the dishes at the church's fundraiser for its mission to the homeless, because whatever faiths we might declare, surely we can all believe in the importance of community. And again, it bears repetition. When I hold a British passport, which declares famously, without let or hindrance, if you still won't call me British, then you can't be surprised if, doubting your good faith, I want to grab my bags and get the hell out. After all, how much more can I integrate? What more is it you want from us? To be white? To be you?